Hey guys, hoping all is well with everyone. So in this video, we're going to be continuing our read-along of the Crime Traveler's Adventure Series, Book 1, Brainwashed. And last time we finished, we completed Chapter 34, and Chapter 34 was kind of a milestone chapter, um, especially for Lucas, in terms of kind of the plot development of this story. Um, Lucas found out a lot of information when they got to the safe house, um, an elderly woman known as uh, Madame Beach. And uh, Mr. Keen, um, Beans was there, um, his dad. But what he realizes in this chapter's development is that Mr. Beans and Kate Beans are actually his adoptive parents. And so he discovers that through pictures and old photographs that he has actually never seen his birth mother, which the uh, madame kind of points out and explains exactly the history of how Lucas's mother, birth mother, used to be a housekeeper for her, and then through things that the good company did, and Miss Guanero kind of doing all of these terrible things, Lucas's birth mother wanted to protect him, so she had given him to um, the safe house woman, and then she gave Lucas to Mr. and Kate Beans to adopt and take care of Lucas. So it unraveled a lot in the plot development. And so now they're kind of going after Miss Guinero with a higher motive more than ever to kind of not only put a stop to her illegal activities, but also because of the information that only Miss Guinero knows about where Lucas's birth mother actually is. But I hope you guys are all doing well, and I hope you enjoy the read today. Chapter 35, The River Sen. In their new old clothes, the five kids stood outside the Shakespeare and Company bookshop. This feels odd, said Astrid. It does, said Nalini. Jackknife shrugged. What? Free clothes? No, said Nalini, not having the baby genie with us. She's part of our team, Astrid said as the two girls looked at each other. Nalini didn't miss a beat. She bolted back into the bookshop, and within a minute she returned to the group with Jeannie in her arms. I don't know about you, Nalini said, breathing a little heavily, but I love this little girl. She makes me so focused. Because she's a baby, and all it makes what we're doing that much more important, you know? Then let's go, Lucas said. The five kids and one baby flew down the street past a blur of graffiti. By the time they reached the wall bar bordering the river, the sun had almost set. Street traffic was whizzing by, and boats were puttering up and down the river. The kids walked under the plain trees light lining the sidewalk, where clusters of booksellers peddled postcards and miniature Eiffel Towers. Just past the booths, a class of art students sat at easels, painting copies of Monet's, Renoir's, and Passero's. Jeannie reached out for one of the postcards. Man, said Travis, that steak frites and french fries was so good. Dude, said Jackknife, frites are french fries. When did you guys eat? Lucas asked. I'm starved. Mr. Beach was cooking in the back of the bookshop said Jackknife. Really nice fellow, said Nalini. Astrid glared at her brother. Where were you th that whole time, Lucas? Um, Lucas hesitated. The upstairs bathroom? The whole time? Astrid said, crinkling her cheeks. Yeah. Well, said Astrid, it's pretty obvious you and Madame Beach have some secret. Right said Nalini. What was that wink she gave you, Lucas, when she told us the name of her boat was The Secret? Yeah, said Travis. What was that all about? Lucas had to think quickly. He couldn't tell them what he had just learned about his mother. Not just yet. That was his mother. His secret. He wanted to hold on to the idea of his mother by himself for a little while, all on his own. Some secrets should be kept secret, but he also had to be honest with his friends. Lucas picked up one of the Eiffel Tower key rings from the booth. My dad, Mr. Beans, was upstairs meeting with Madame Beach. They think the good company is losing money, and they think Miss Guanero is desperate. Travis and Jackknife nodded. 
But Lucas could tell his answer didn't satisfy his sister. Okay, said Astrid, putting a postcard back. But we don't even know where we're going. They glared at Lucas. Without looking, Lucas returned the key ring to its peg and ran the map of the city through his head. They told me that Ms. Guinero was still planning on kidnapping a group of kids to sell on Bungu. But, knowing Miss Guinero, she'd do her work not in the dark alley, but in the most obvious places. And in Paris, there's only one place. That's obvious, said Travis, but they lost the contract to guard the Eiffel Tower. Wait, said Jackknife. They're having a carnival there tonight, right? The lady likes an audience, said Travis, if you haven't noticed. Brilliant, said Nalini, laughing to herself. Perfectly brilliant plan. It is perfect, Astrid shook her head. Sick, but perfect, isn't it? There was a strange calmness when they got to the edge of the river. No one was behind them, no croaking boys or Magnus or guards, no police. No one even noticed when six kids climbed on into the baby blue seats of a boat named Le Secret. Madame Beach's boat was gorgeous. It was a 1967 Italian-made Riva with a mahogany hull and a shiny teak decks. Lucas united the boat from the dock, untied it, and hitched the ropes around the brass cleats and pushed the boat back. Briefly, he caught his reflection in the dark water and shuddered at the prospect of falling in. A memory of an explosion flashed in his mind. He hoped Jackknife really knew how to drive a boat. Jackknife cranked the V8 engine, spun the motorboat around, and cut into open water. Astrid, Nalini, and Jeannie moved to the back of the boat, and the murmur of the motor quickly lulled Jeannie into a nap. With the wind in his hair, Lucas stared back at the girls and envisioned his own mother sitting at the very spot, fifteen years earlier. As night settled over the Seine, Jackknife flicked on the running lights and sped through the dark water. Lucas and Travis leaned over the front windshield. The sight of City of Lights was brightly, brightly lit, but the river water was murky and ominous. Darkness worried Lucas the most. He hated the idea of their boat crashing and of having to swim through cold black water. He glanced around, hoping to spot a life jacket or at least a styrofoam ice chest. But there was nothing left to save them. They glided past barges, water taxis, and sightseeing boats. Lights decorated the angles of flyboats, and cameras clicked as tourists gazed in amazement at all the sights. Jackknife powered the little boat past the Paris beach, the famed Louvre Museum, and the Place de la Concorde, and the Grand Palais. They rounded a bend in the river, and that's where, when they saw it, the highlight of any Parisian cruise. The Eiffel Tower. Lit by thousands of lights, the Eiffel Tower was ablaze in electricity. Jeannie opened her eyes. Ooh! She cooed. They tied Madame Beach's boat to a floating dock between two enormous barges, and everyone got off the boat except Jackknife. I'll stay, he said. Travis asked, Are you all right? Yeah, said Jackknife, who still looked a little pale. I'll turn the boat around in case of water evacuation. Astrid seemed calm, like she knew everything would be fine. She looked to Lucas. Which way, map boy? Lucas pointed, and Astrid led the others across the busy street bordering the river. For a second, Lucas slowed down and checked behind him. He spotted Coach Creed, Robbie, and Sophia climbing out of a van. Plan B was in place, just in case. Lucas quickly caught up with the others. They ran into a neighborhood and hurried down trash-filled lanes where cats screeched from behind parked cars. From a lighted apartment window above their heads, they could hear a piano playing jazz and a woman cackling loudly. Like floating moons, big white street lamps lit the Champ de Mars. Good company security officers with German shepherds patrolled the pathways of the wide, grassy park leading to the Eiffel Tower. To the east, Napoleon's mausoleum hid in the shadows. To the west, the Eiffel Tower dominated the skyline. Straight ahead, there was a giant carnival. This is the place, 
said Lucas. Chapter 36, Carnival. Underneath the canopy of trees sprouted a makeshift village of white tents bustling with excitement. Boys and girls in colorful costumes were throwing spears across hedges. Jesters, fire eaters, and jugglers clumped together in small packs to rehearse their acts. Next to the Eiffel Tower, there was a collection of jumping castles, a rappelling rope, and an enormous slide sloping down from the tower's first floor. We should do that slide, said Travis, on a board. You sound like my mother, said Astrid, but we're not doing that. I guess, Lucas said, we can't do the climbing wall and rappelling rope either. Astrid didn't even answer. She, Nalini, and Jeannie cut straight across the park toward the Eiffel Tower. Lucas and Travis followed. They all formed a tight line through a thick crowd, weaving their way up the midway, where tents were decorated with international flags. Banners on top of the tents popped in the wind, and the air smelled of cinnamon and crepes. There were kids everywhere. In the opposite direction, there were bumper cars, candy grabbers, and coin pushers. Lights flashed and bells rang. Lucas couldn't help but think how fun it would be to just stop and play games. The other side had a Velcro wall, sumo wrestling, and a bungee run. Sounds from a western shooting gallery snapped like firecrackers, and Jeannie cried out at the noise. Ooh, she breathed. Pow! Jackknife would love this, said Astrid. This is like, like carnival in Brazil. This is a carnival. Nalini started to say something to Travis, but yawned instead. The group followed Astrid through a mob of excited carnival goers. A group of Belgians wearing black, yellow, and red robes were racing on stilts while little kids ran underneath their wooden legs. The side alleys were dotted with arcade games and food trailers. Popcorn, cotton candy, and french fries with mayonnaise. Through all the noise, Luca recognized a voice. Guillotine! The boy he and Astrid had seen all day before was playing with his cardboard guillotine. Yes! He said. Then in his bad, fake French accent, he called out, The blade is cardboard. So you get the sensation of whack without the blood. The boy continued to raise and lower the cardboard blade over the mannequin. He beckoned down the midway in an attempt to get the others to play at his booth. Mary Antoinette, Lewis says. Simon says. Opposite this guillotine, they all spotted the juggler from the Pompidou Center doing his same routine of tossing burning batons into the air. Everyone suddenly seemed strangely familiar. Travis, who was walking ahead of the others, came to a full stop. Step right up, he said, mocking a carnival voice. Get your peach fuzz mustaches right here. Get them while they last. Yeah, said Lucas. I see them too. Two o'clock. Ten o'clock. You're right, said Nalini. There's a Karuki and man in every booth. The group now moved slowly as they kept an eye on the Karukians. At most carnivals, the games were rigged to help the carnival people. This fair was the opposite. Every player was actually a winner. At the ball toss, they were practically giving away balls. It occurred to Lucas that if all the boys, these Karukians, were brainwashed to work for Miss Guinero, then they could just be easily be brainwashed to recruit other children. Maybe all the booths were recruiting centers, secret back doors into the good company. At the next intersection, they came upon a massive group of ball toss winners. Hundreds of kids carrying balls, soccer balls, American footballs, rugby balls, were streaming up and down the midway. Lucas scanned the group and recognized no one. Astrid and Nalini spotted several kids they had hoped not to see. Oh no, said Astrid. There's Kerala, and Sora, said Nalini, and that little Terry kid, said Astrid, the one from the airplane who wasn't supposed to leave, Robbie's going to be mad at him. Before they could say or do anything, they had to move out of the way. Coming down the main midway was a parade, 
a Dixieland band and a mob of carnival re- revelers dressed in the wildest costumes danced in the lane, parting the crowd to the sides. It was Carnival, Mardi Gras, and New Year's Day all in one. Men in white masks and frilly costumes led the main group. They grouped so much candy and confetti that it looked like snowfall. Kids in, crowd, kids in the crowd went crazy, scrambling for bonbons. Behind this group, tall women dressed in elaborate gowns covered in reflective sequins, rhinestones, and colorful pheasant feathers pranced through the carnival street. A line of parade floats with cartoon characters and spacemen followed the dancers. Then a troop of flagged trumpeters marched in and introduced the carnival queen. Beams of light began crisscrossing in the midway in anticipation of something big. Nalini and Astrid were speechless. They stood with their mouths and eyes wide open as they watched the final costume entering. The queen's dress was part gown, part parade float. Four Karukians held the skirt of a flowing lace dress that fanned out, its hem flowing on motorized wheels. The dress was entirely covered in tiny mirrors and rhinestones, white and silver with flickers of blue. In the center of this floating dress and partially hidden behind a glittering mask was Siba Guanero. Ostrich feathers two meters tall sprouted from Miss Guanero's headdress, while diamond-like wings soared, it, soared behind her. A single move of her hand gave the impression that she was breezing through a field of falling stars. The CEO of the good company smiled and waved brightly as she presented herself to the crowd as Carnival Queen and Mistress of Ceremonies. She began to play a small piano keyboard in front of her, and she filled the night air with Beethoven's Fourth Symphony. The crowd went crazy for it and gathered around Miss Guarnero, clapping and dancing along with her as she parted the sea of people. That is absolutely gorgeous, said Nalini as she held Jeannie up to sea. Astrid nodded reflexively. It's the most beautiful dress in the world. Right, right, said Travis. I mean, who wouldn't like a dress that's part truck? Lucas had long since stopped watching Miss Guanero and focused his gaze on the Eiffel Tower. He'd known Miss Guarnero would eventually show up, but he couldn't believe how ridiculously over the top this lady was. She would, of course, do anything to get her way with kidnapping and brainwashing at the top of her list. Lucas spun around with the others and watched the parade fade down the midway. Off to the side, he recognized a sign. Bus ball. A greeting in 20 languages read, A winner every time. Lucas turned to the group. Bus ball, he said. Bus ball, said Jeannie. Lucas nodded. That's what she's been saying all day. No, bus ball said Jeannie. Lucas understood. He marched straight up to the tent and threw open the front flap. Lucas, said a familiar voice, but of course. And I'll stop the video there, ending chapter 36. But I hope you guys enjoyed the read aloud today. I hope you guys are all doing well. Please take good care of yourselves and be safe. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time as we continue our read along and more approaching the conclusion of the Crime Traveler's Adventure Series, Brainwashed. As always, guys, take good care and be safe. And thank you so much for watching.